Ready? Let's welcome Tim as he comes, a pastor of Crane Baptist Church. Amen. Test, test. There we go. My, my big hog calling mouth, you can hear me. As we are going through praise and worship to... Of course it's on top. <sighs> Thank you. It's always the short guy. As one of my ex-elders entered the building tonight, I went up and put a hug on him, and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were going to be here. Otherwise, I would have worked the keys into the sermon. But during our praise and worship, two things came to mind. Through the singing of, some of the, the, one of the songs, Max Licato tells us that there are over 7,000 promises of God in the Bible. Do we believe them? I have another question for you that came up to mind while I was listening. How hungry are you tonight? No, I'm serious. How hungry are you? I don't mean the chicken we had. I had my fair share, and I was sharing with people earlier, all pastors enjoy fried chicken. Do you know why? Just to get back at that rooster that crowed on Peter. King James Version of the Bible has 810,667 words in it. Jesus tells us that we are to not live on bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How hungry are you tonight? As Gerald told you already, I have been meditating on this message for over a month. But when I looked up the word revival in the dictionary, it says an improvement in the condition or strength of something. Our strength is Jesus Christ. He doesn't need any improvement. I looked up the word a biblical, of a biblical definition of the word revival. And it says an awakening spiritually. Does the church need a spiritual awakening? My question to you then is, does our society need revival? In my opinion, I believe greatly. Before my work schedule changed here recently, my wife and I went to four different fairs every weekend. Each and every one had a demolition derby. Okay, that's not a, a popular subject, okay? <laughs> it has been with my wife and I, we've been doing this for almost 30 years. It's just something that we can go and do, and it's an expensive, an inexpensive evening. But as we were there, the four different fairs I attended, I noticed something every night. And I noticed that it was always the ladies and not every single one, but some of them had a t-shirt on, and they were all the same. And that t-shirt said, caffeine, chaos, cussing. The first time, I just thought, okay, that's it. No big deal. Then I noticed it at the second fair. Then I noticed it at the third fair. And the fourth fair, I said, God, what are you telling me? I've been meditating on this for a month. I don't believe that that was an accident. I believe God was talking to me. 
we just all agreed that our, our society needs revival. And if this is what society is saying is acceptable, I wonder what God's position is on these subjects. Do you think they need a spiritual awakening? First of all, when I looked at caffeine, do you realize that the word caffeine is not in the Bible? So I hear all the coffee drinkers sitting there saying, okay, I'm safe. <laughs> you can go on, you talk to the person down the pew for me. So is it okay to consume caffeine? Uh, yes, it is, because I drink Mountain Dew. <laughs> but the problem is, not having an occasional cup of coffee. If you're going around brow proudly discussing that you survive on caffeine as your strength, I think you got an issue. See, it's not the caffeine. It's the addiction to the caffeine. And when we start discussing it as an addiction, then I have an issue. Go into a convenience store at the gas, gas station and just look at the, the coolers and see all the drinks that are loaded with caffeine that is an option for you to purchase. My question is, do we have coffee shops just everywhere? I have gone and visited churches that have a coffee kiosk inside the church. My question is, can we not worship our God without having a caffeinated drink in our hand? Ooh, that's pretty harsh, Pastor. I've witnessed it going to the sanctuary. Have we lost the reverence for our sanctuary. Yes, I may have a drink of water when my throat is a little scratchy or has the effects of a cold or allergy or a little bit too much yelling at a demolition derby for my favorite driver. But what does God say about the subject? Colossians 2.16 says, Therefore, let no one sit in judgment on you in the matters of food or drink, or with regard to a feast day, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. I'm not here judging anyone on what you drink or what you don't drink. I'm here talking to God's people who are called to be holy. Proverbs 25, 16 says, Hast thou found honey? Eat as much as sufficient for thee, lest you be filled with the filled therewith and vomited. I think Solomon's telling us things in moderation are okay, but when we get in excess then it becomes trouble. Philippians 4, 5 says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Hmm. Moderation. Isn't that interesting? 1 Corinthians 9, 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it for a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And 927 says, but I keep under and bring into subjection, lest by my means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. God's word is clear. Nothing is good or nothing is technically bad until we abuse it. 
and then it becomes an issue. As long as we are temperate, as long as we are in moderation, as long as we have self-control and self-discipline, it is okay. But what happens when we get things out of control and it becomes an addiction? Then it is in control and we are not. And if something is in control of us other than Jesus Christ, it can become an idol. You see, God's word says it is okay in moderation. The biblical de definition of temperance is moderation in indulgences of appetites or passions. So in my opinion, our society needs a caffeine addiction revival. The second one on that list, I'm going to go out of order. I'm going to go to the cussing. Now, that used to be just our sailors. I had to get that in. And bar language. When did cursing become normal, everyday language? Oh, you can hear it at the checkout line at the store. You wouldn't believe all the names I have been called. For those of you that don't know me, I worked 40 years in the grocery business. Until just two months ago, God changed my direction. It doesn't matter if you're women or men, or if you're young or you're old. You hear it everywhere, and society says it is okay. I can remember television when married couples on TV shows slept in different beds. Now you hear profanity. We won't talk about all the advertisement and all that stuff. But it's okay. Colossians 3.8 says, But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearts. Does our language minister to people's hearts? What kind of message are we sending if every other word is a curse word? Proverbs 8.13 says, For the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Froward, I don't know about you, but that hasn't come up in conversation the last week. I had to look it up. It has many definitions, but one of them was perverse. I will reread this, the Proverbs then. For the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the perverse mouth do I hate. Interesting thoughts, isn't it? Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. I sure hope none of you are behind me when I'm sitting in front of Jesus because that Dewey, remember the old Dewey Decimal System in the library and you pulled it out and you pulled it out and there's all these cards? You know how many idle words I've said over the years? My file's going to be huge. I feel sorry for you, the one that's been sitting behind me. Because I'm sure none of you are going to have that issue, are you? James 3.10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Hmm. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. God takes our words seriously. Our words are power. Especially we, we Christians that are a new creation in Christ. Do we take our words seriously? I would be lying if I said that I never curse. 
But yet, the, I have a question. Does it bring glory to Christ and edify the body, or am I slinging mud on him? Many years ago, there was a Sunday school book that we had that we studied, and it was talked about the several things that Christians do, and many of them were like slinging mud on our Lord and Savior. I think our society needs a language revival. The third thing on our t-shirt was chaos. This was a difficult one to, to research and study. But am I the only one that thinks our society is in chaos? Whether it be spiritually, economically, or politically. Hello, anybody out there? Am I the only one that thinks this? Okay, I just want to make sure. Am I in the boat without a paddle here or what? Second Chronicles 15.5 tells us, In those days, no one could travel safely, for total chaos had overtaken all the people of the surrounding lands. Stop and think about that a minute. The people couldn't travel because there was chaos. Aren't you glad we don't have those issues today? There's not terrorism all over. Do we not have to have homeland security for going through an airport? How many drive-by shootings do you have? How many uh, <clears throat> pull up to a stoplight and you have carjackings in the large cities? Now we even hear of them happening in our smaller cities. We don't have chaos. We're fine. We don't have issues traveling by car either, do we? Today, people are just so selfish in that they're in their way so in such a hurry they put others in harm's way by deliberately disobeying traffic laws. How many of you have been passed by someone in the no passing zone? Or had someone sling by you when you're trying to make a left-hand turn on the highway? Into Crane Church. This morning. Isaiah 24, 10 says, The city of chaos is shattered. Every house is closed to entry. I'm certainly glad we don't have those issues in our society today, do we? Go to St. Louis, East St. Louis. Go to Chicago, any of the large cities. What do you see? All the bars on the windows. Why? Is it because there's evil in a society in chaos? How much rioting and looting do we see on the evening news? Ferguson, Los Angeles, Chicago. Isaiah 45, 18 tells us, For this is what the Lord says, who created the heavens. He is God and the one who formed the earth and made it. And he is the one who established it. He didn't create it for chaos, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. We are supposed to be inhabiting this world and loving our neighbors. And God is a God of order, and his laws are forever. The sea is in its place since the day of creation. The sun is in his place. The moon is in his place. When we approach God, he is in his place, and we must approach him by his statutes. So if God is a God of order, by whom has chaos entered into this world? The adversary, Satan. Acts 21, 30, and this is a strange first to put into this section, but I think it applies greatly to our modern society in our evening news. Then the whole city was aroused and thrown into confusion, or chaos, 
And the people rushed together. They laid hands on Paul and dragged him outside the temple, and immediately the gates were closed. Now you hear that and you think, Pastor, why did you include this scripture? And I say, can't you see this happening today? With the crowd being the LGBT community. And any pastor that stands up to this abomination, they are laying hands on him and assaulting him and dragging him into court. God's word is alive and applicable today. Any person that stands up against their agenda, agenda is a hater. Again, I say, God is not a God of confusion or chaos. He is a God of order. Where there is chaos, chaos and hatred are rooted in the adversary. Because 1 Corinthians 4.33 tells us that he is a God of order. I will close with these scriptures. I don't normally quote from the version of the Bible, the message, but I'm going to read this from the version of the, called the message, and it's Proverbs 28, 2 through 12. Listen carefully. When a country is in chaos, everyone has a plan to fix it but it takes a leader of real understanding to straighten things out. Verse 3, the wicked who oppress the poor are like a hailstorm that beats down the harvest. Verse 4, if you desert God's law, you're free to embrace depravity. If you love God's law, you fight for it tooth and nail. Verse 5, justice makes no sense to the evil-minded. Those who seek God know it inside and out. Verse 6, it's better to be poor and direct than rich and crooked. Verse 7, practice God's law. Get a reputation for wisdom. Hang out with a loose crowd and embarrass your family. Boy, that sounds like my mother. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm 56 years old, and I still hear her voice in my ear. Timothy, Eugene. Yes, the pastor's hearing voices. Ooh. Get as rich as you want through cheating and extortion, but eventually some friend of the poor is going to give it all back to them. Verse 9, God has no use for the prayers of people who won't listen to him. Verse 10, lead good people down a wrong path and you'll come to a bad end. Do good and you'll be rewarded for it. Verse 11, the rich think they know it all, but the poor can see right through them. Boy, that sounds like Congress, doesn't it? In verse 12, when good people are promoted, everything is great. But when bad people are in charge, watch out. Society needs a chaos revival, an improvement or awakening spiritually. Does the church need revival? Does the church need improvement? Does the church need an awakening spiritually? Matthew 6.24 tells us, No man can serve, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now money, now mammon refers to money and the gain through evil means. Now, I just gave my last dollar bill, so now I don't have a dollar bill in my wallet to use it as an example. We're going to pretend this is a dollar, unless someone's got a dollar they want to give me. 
Doesn't that sound like a typical preacher asking for money? Are you kidding me? Good grief. Hey. Yee yee. You, alms for the poor. This is neither good nor evil. It's a piece of paper with some printing on it. It has no power. It has no life. It's not alive. It is nothing. It only becomes good or evil when it's placed in the hand of a person who gains control of it. And that person can use it for good or they can use it for evil. Jesus says it's how you look and how you use this. You're either going to do one or you're going to do the other. You can't do both. So instead of a dollar in Jesus' little story, what happens if we substituted caffeine? It's neither good nor evil. It's how we use it. Substitute our language, good or bad. It's how we use it. Chaos versus order. Which do we choose? Again, I ask you, will we serve God and on his ways and his statutes, or will we allow the world to enter this sanctuary and influence us how we approach and how we serve God? Does the church need revival? On that thought, let us prepare our hearts for our final hymn.